afternoon, everybody in the room and also online. A, uh, a warm welcome to uh, the start of the new C-Star lecture series season. Uh, we're really excited about the lineup that we have this year so far. We also still have a few open slots to fill with awesome speakers. Um, in two weeks' time, uh, we'll be listening to uh, Mick McNeil, who will give uh, an online presentation. Um, on uh, the task and purity problem in aphasia testing, so the difficulty of assessing cognitive uh, issues other than purely linguistic or, or language problems. So that should be really interesting as well. As well. Um, I should also remind you, uh, since you are a captive audience now, that uh, my department, and the department that many of the C-Star uh, research is working, uh, communication Sciences and Disorders at the University of South Carolina is organizing uh, its own conference um, on October 11th and, in, and uh, lectures at that conference can also be attended online so even if you're far away and have no travel plans to come to South Carolina uh, you can attend that conference so please visit uh, the university website go to the Department of Comedy and then I'm sure you can't uh, miss it um, the speaker for today, Greg Hickok, will be introduced by William Matchin, our my friend from Communication Sciences and Disorders. Uh, at one point, I abbreviated Greg's title for an uh, uh, online advertisement to language in the human and non-human private brain. And after I clicked enter, I thought, I thought, no, that's not what he's talking about. He's not going to talk about language in the non-human brain. <laughs> William Matchin. So it's a great pleasure of mine to introduce Dr. Gregory Hickok from the University of California, Irvine. He's my former PhD supervisor and erstwhile collaborator. Uh, so Greg, I don't want to take up too much of his time, but he's going to be talking about neuroarchitectural homologies for language in the human and non-human primate brain. And his recent work um, has returned to a topic that he actually started off his dissertation and early research work was in uh, agrarianism and focusing on syntax in the brain. And then at some point, he transitioned a bit away from that and started focusing on other issues, particularly speech production and speech comprehension, which resulted in the very well-known dual-stream model. Um, and then spent a little bit of time away from syntax, but is now sort of returning to it and combining those different research streams. So it should be a very interesting presentation. So please help me welcome before I get to talk. to be introduced by your former student and current collaborator, Ms. William. Um, all right, so. Try to let the slideshow work first. Okay, we're good. All right, so here's the title. Uh, we'll start with a sneak peek. So I'm going to tell you kind of the take-home messages so you know where I'm going and can check out if you need to. Um, one, one point I'm going to make is the architecture matters. Um, uh, a second point is thinking like an evolutionary biologist can actually help us understand uh, the neuroscience of language. And it's what I've been doing for the last 20 years or so. Um, I didn't know I was doing it until more recently. Uh, but now I'm kind of making it explicit, uh, sharing with you the kind of insights that I've been able to gain by thinking in this way. Um, so hopefully you'll be able to see that. Um, what the conclusion that I've actually reached is that the neural organization, and by that I mean basically phonology, syntax, kind of those sorts of aspects of language, is homologous to a basic sensory mode organization. I'm going to explain what I mean by that. This is not an embodied cognition claim. It does not preclude abstract language-specific representations, Chomsky can still be right, William will be glad to hear that, in this framework, okay? So I'm not saying that we should abandon abstract linguistic anything. I'm saying we can think of it as homologous to stuff that isn't right in our, in our brains and other brains, uh, non-human species. Um, another point is that language hierarchies are instantiated in sensory motor hierarchies. So when we think about phonology versus syntax as hierarchical levels of language, we can think of that in kind of classical sensory motor hierarchies. So we'll get to that. Um, and the final thing is that there's a, a, a comprehension production asymmetry in the sense that production needs sensory systems, uh, and comprehension does not need motor systems. So it's, it's, 
Their sensory motor systems are tightly connected. We all agree on that. But there's an asymmetry. People comprehend without motor. You need sensory perceptual systems in order to act at all, period. So, um, so we'll start with architecture. So this is the case for architecture, or don't diss the box and arrow. Um, I'm a fan of box and arrows. People sometimes don't, you know, they look at them and oh, it's just a box and arrow model, give me the dynamics. Um, but I want to argue for the importance of that. Of course, there's lots of interesting and important work on neural dynamics. Uh, oscillations, for example, are very popular. This is all good, important, useful information, um, but it's not the whole story. So. Um, Dynamics are going to operate in the context of some architecture. It's just not a random set of nodes that are interacting dynamically. There's some architecture that constrains that interaction. And that is an important point. Uh, that's what determines the input-output relation. The, the dynamics, to the extent that they compute them, um, do their job. And we can kind of get a sense of this from neural network models, the deep neural nets. So here's a quote from a recent neural network paper, uh, kind of the engineering side of this. Neural networks are powerful and flexible models that work well for many different learning tasks of image, uh, speech, and natural language understanding. Despite their success, neural networks are still hard to design. If any of you have played with designing neural networks, you know it's a non-trivial task designing these things. Why is that the case? Because the success of a network depends on its architecture. Um, the architecture is key to making a network do the right thing. And finding that architecture can be hard. Um, furthermore, if you find one that works, how do you know it's optimized? It's hard, it's hard to tell. Um, so that's the main problem. Remember, connectionist networks from the 80s and through the 90s kind of fizzled out and people lost faith in AI doing anything. The reason why we have a renaissance is because they explored a different architecture. There's a deep neural network. They added more layers, they messed with the architecture, and suddenly, <coughs> lo and behold, these models can do more. So the architecture was the key to getting from where we were in the 80s to Siri and all the other uh, deep neural networks that would do their job. We can even think about this more generally. So neurons, single nodes in these things, all have similar dynamics, right? If neurons basically do the same thing. Uh, it's how these neurons enter into the networks, the architectures that, uh, that, that do the work that we're interested in. So um, to continue a quote from that same paper, along with this success is a paradigm shift from feature designing to architecture design. So now, a lot of the work in neural network design is figuring out what architecture to use. So that's my case for, for architecture. Don't diss the box and arrows. Um, the box and arrow models are architectural hypotheses about the structure of the network. Um, the dynamics are the things that live in between. We need the, the complementary ideas, not one versus the other. So that's that. So, um, so this, this is my justification, justification for why I've been approaching the topic of the language of language neuroscience the way I have. So my approach to any problem in language neuroscience is first to consider what the architecture is. Well, what's the architecture of the system? Um, that led to dual stream, very coarse kind of thinking. Um, and then once I get a sketch of that, then I'll start looking at the internal computational dynamics. So that's my general mode. It's not necessarily the right way, there's no right way to do it, but that's generally what I'm doing. So the brief historical kind of view of how things went uh, in terms of language maps. In, uh, from about the 1870s up until the 1970s, with a gap of no interest in the brain in between, um, among many, um, we had pretty nice architectural models. I mean, they were clean, they were tidy, they had a couple of nodes, uh, they interacted. Um, but then when the 90s came around, about the time that I started working in this field, um, we realized that the Bernanke lifetime kind of approach was too simplified, there was more complications, and so we knew it was wrong, but what replaced it was not very much. So we had nice architectures in psycholinguistics, which is what this, this box here is, that's the Phelps model. And then this is actually a figure from Gazzaniga's textbook, showing what we understood about the relation between psycholinguistic uh, you know, uh, architectures and brain architecture, and it's a bunch of question marks. So that's where we were when I came into the field. Um, and then in the 2000s, when functional imaging really took off, we ended up with a whole bunch of language areas. We realized it wasn't just Brooks and Bernanke's area, it was a whole bunch of areas involved. We all know this now. But the problem was, at the time, um, what's the architecture? Is it just a bunch of phrenological zones? Uh, are they, how are they interacting? What's the structure? What's the architecture behind it? And that was the problem. So, 
Um, and that was essentially the problem that I was interested in solving when uh, David Popo and I developed the dual stream model. And uh, looking back at where the inspiration came from, it came from evolutionary uh, thinking. Okay, so I want to illustrate that. So, um, the notion is, uh, the key notion is the notion of an evolutionary homology, which is essentially the idea that if you find similarities between, uh, typically the classic example is this, is the, the mammalian uh, forelimb. So you can look at your, your hand and see uh, the basic structure of it. Um, it has the number of bones that it has in it uh, and due to evolution. Um, and you look across the species from cats to whales to bats and you find basically the same structure. They've been tweaked through evolution to serve different functions, radically different functions. But they're basically the same underlyingly. And the reason for that, and this is the key thing, is because they came from a common ancestor. There was some ancestral mammal that had this body plan. And then evolution tinkered with that uh, ever since. And you get this kind of, this homology, this similarity in, in structure. Okay, so it's a common ancestor kind of argument. And of course, the concept of an animal model for you know, cognitive brain function is based on evolutionary homology. So you know, rats and cats and monkey uh, studies uh, are relevant to understanding human cognition because there are expected homologies of function and architecture due to our shared evolutionary history. Okay. Um, that's the basis of doing animal work. It's, it's the, the notion of homology. So this is key, fundamental, basic evolutionary biology. So what about language? Well, the excuse that I used to give, we all gave back in the 80s when we were basically stuck with the Bernanke lip time model and the vision people were doing maps and all sorts of things, making lots of progress, was that we couldn't make the same progress as vision people could because we had no um, animal model. We didn't have a, a language, a homologous language system that we could go to. Um, because language is unique to home sapiens. Um, but I think that's wrong. And certainly there's no other animals that have language like we do. However, there may be, in fact there are, I'm going to argue, homologies between, that exist between language systems and non-linguistic systems in other animals and in our own heads. Our own brains. So that's what I want to try. Um, so consider the fact that language ability has many potential homologies to non-language cognitive functions. So generally, perception. I mean, these are things that are true of language and other domains as well. Perception, action, long-term memory, short-term memory, categorization, abstraction, decision making, sequencing, hierarchical processing to some extent, all exist outside of the language language domain. And if we think about where these things came from. Um, we can look at our, uh, our family tree. So here's a family tree. Uh, the split of pan uh, occurs way down here. Um, so that's chimps and the great apes, the existing great apes are. Uh, there's a couple other splits, uh, and you get to the, the homo group. And we evolved way late, about 300,000 years ago. So way up here. Language emerges. There's disagreement, and we don't really know. But language emerges somewhere between about one and a half million years ago to some people say 40,000 years ago. So the point is that language is recent in our evolutionary history. What this points out is that we know that these critters uh, were very intelligent. They were cognitively sophisticated. There was a lot of computational cognitive machinery already existing in our uh, ancestors. And it was that context so, you know, they were capable of all these things, presumably, that uh, I outlined that looked like homologies to language. And this was the neurocomputational landscape out of which language evolved. So that was the brain state. So it's useful to think that's the brain state in which language evolved. Okay? And evolution doesn't invent things de novo. It tinkers with what's lying around. So it is fair to say, to assume, um, that what we see in terms of our language organization is going to be related to what pre-existed. It's going to be a tinkering of what was there. And what was there was a lot of these other things that we still have, like action, perception, these sorts of things. So uh, we should be able to constrain our architectural and computational hypotheses for language by looking to homologies with non-language systems in our own brain as well as in non-human animals. So that means we can use uh, single unit neurophysiology in monkeys to learn something about language. All right, so here's an example. This is kind of a toy example, but just to give you a sense. Um, 
Presumably there was some ancestral motor control circuit. Let's pretend it's involved in grasping. It exists, we know that people study that in cats um, and lots of other animals. Um, the cats don't have speech. Um, we have manual control like the cats, and we also have speech. And those systems are non-identical. Um, but presumably the speech circuit, I mean, it's a, still a motor control circuit at some level, presumably there was some uh, modification with descent such that those circuits that are really useful in, in grasping and, and reaching for things uh, were modified and uh, tuned so that they would be very useful for speech. Okay? So you end up with kind of a relation like this where speech and manual control are the evolutionary kind of current species of motor control, but they have a common motor control ancestor. And to that extent, they will have similar architectural and computational properties. So given that, so logically this makes a lot of sense. The question is, do we see homologies? Um, and the answer is yes. The, the, um, uh, we see a common plan for vision, hearing, and speech uh, in the division of dorsal and ventral streams. So you have a stream from the perceptual standpoint. You have one stream that's needed for recognizing objects uh, or uh, you know, objects of various sorts, including linguistic objects and another stream that takes that auditory or visual information and transforms it into <coughs> action patterns. Those are the dorsal and ventral streams. The inspiration for developing the dual stream model of language was actually vision work. I read a book by Milner and Goodale, uh, was completely convinced by it, and saw parallels to language. So that was basically evolutionary thinking. There's parallels in the structure, the architecture of uh, sensory motor, visual motor systems in monkeys that work for speech Let's use what we know from monkeys to apply it to our understanding of how language works. There are also neuropsychological homologies. I'm not going to take the time to show you examples of what optic ataxia are. Basically, optic ataxia is a deficit in visual motor integration where people can see objects, but they have trouble uh, reaching for them um, in space or orienting to them. Conduction aphasia, as you know, is a sensory motor disorder or it's a speech, a language disorder where people don't seem to have any trouble comprehending but make a lot of speech errors at the phonological level. And they tend to grow almost like an optic ataxia, an optic ataxic for the particular target they're trying to hit. Okay. So this is just a we'll skip that. Just a chart <coughs> of the similarities between these things. So in optic ataxia, you have dorsal stream lesions. Same thing in conduction aphasia, the damage tends to be around the temporal prior of junction. Uh, object recognition is intact in optic ataxia, in conduction aphasia, word recognition is intact. Uh, in optic ataxia, reaching is characterized by groping for, uh, for the targets, and speech in conduction aphasia is characterized by phonological errors and repeated self-correction attempts. So this is kind of like you know, verbal groping, right? Uh, and so we conclude that optic ataxia is a visual motor integration deficit, uh, and conduction aphasia, my conclusion, is that it's an auditory motor integration deficit. So homologous, it's a similar kind of neuropsychological syndrome in the two domains. Okay, so we'd expect some parallels, and here's an example. If Laura Buxbaum ever watches this, she'll correct me and say conduction of aid. The optic ataxy isn't quite the right homology. There's another syndrome that's a little closer, but I'm aware of that, Laurel. Um, you're right, <laughs> but this is good enough for now. Okay. So, so given that, so we have kind of functional uh, homologies, and here is just an illustration that, that the, the anatomy should be similar. Okay, so that's basically, um, and we see similarities in the anatomy between what we propose in terms of language and what was proposed for vision. Okay, dorsal ventral All right. So um, I want to start moving towards the idea of to, to to think about this in phonological terms. So. I'm sure it makes sense that speech motor control and manual control might be homologous, right? That seems pretty obvious. And people who do speech motor control, like the Frank Gunthers of the world, um, approach it from John Hood, they approach it from an engineering standpoint, um, using motor control principles, and that all makes sense to us. Okay, that's good. What I've done is take the next step and say, it's not just low-level motor control that this architecture applies to. It applies to levels up. It applies to ab more abstract phonological levels. And so that's what I want to kind of convince you of. So 
hopefully I've convinced you that conduction aphasia and optic ataxia, or these other syndromes, are homologous and they are sensory motor. Um, here's the thing, conduction aphasia is generally considered to be a phonological disorder, right? It's not apraxia of speech. It is a higher level phonological disorder. People have called it a specific ability, in, inability to encode phonological information. Um, but it seems to be built on a sensory motor plan, it's homologous. So the idea is that, well, maybe phonology is, the, the architecture of phonology, as we understand it linguistically, is basically a sensory motor kind of system, but a level up. It's not low level motor control, it's higher level motor control. This is the case for sensory motor phonology, and I'm going to preview it for you and then talk about some details. So, if this is the case, then visual motor and language related sensory motor deficits should be caused by damage to similar but distinguishable areas. That is, the lesion should be in the right places. If optic ataxia was caused by damage to the parietal lobe and conduction evasion was caused by damage to prefrontal cortex, I'd be a little worried. Those are not homologous brain areas. So, so the prediction is that they should be in similar zones because on the assumption that uh, cortices in a particular region are doing similar kinds of things. Okay? Uh, so those should be similar. We should see similar response properties in, uh, uh, in language compared to what you see in visual motor. So sensory motor responses, motor effective selectivity, motor planning error detection, as like altered feedback stuff. Um, and if that's the case, uh, if all of this is right, then if we develop a model that uses a sensory motor architecture that is homologous to what we understand in the visual motor domain, then that should nicely explain the language disorders we see. So if we actually built a model that said, uh, this is how language is organized for conduction aphasia, but it didn't explain conduction aphasia very well, that would be a problem, right? So it's got to fit this, this into the nicely. All right. And again, this is not a case for a grounded or flattened or less abstract phonology. It's not what I'm arguing at all. Okay, just re-emphasizing that. Um, so I want to I want to do a little bit of a digression and talk about the dual stream model from a slightly different perspective, which I've done before. Uh, in fact, with you guys, I think as well. But I want to re-emphasize it. So as you know. Um, the dual stream model basically assumes that we perform two computationally distinct tasks with auditory speech information that is recognizing what it, it, it's hearing, that's the concept stream, or the benefit stream as it's more often called, and to compute how to reproduce it with the vocal tract, that's the sensory motor stream. And this is just a picture of the anatomy of the basic proxology and the anatomy of it. Um, Really important to understand that these, that this idea of a dual stream model is developed from the perspective of perception. It's, a, it's auditory centric. So if you're sitting in the auditory system looking at the brain system, uh, you see two streams. You see one stream going from auditory system up into the motor system, up into the anterior to the motor system, and another stream going ventrally. So that's the dorsal and ventral stream. Um, if you're sitting somewhere else, if you're sitting, say, from the perspective of a picture in the room, um, now you're looking at the system from this angle, and it doesn't look like two streams. It looks like, you know, you're, these are semantic or lexical, this is phonological. It looks more like a hierarchy than a dual stream kind of organization. That's just from the perspective that you, you look at. So that's a really important point. Um, and so if we can kind of abstract over this, this is kind of the hierarchy of these sensory motor networks as I see them. So um, the, the dual stream model initially, when we're talking about phonological level stuff, that's kind of this stream. So basically the color codes correspond to levels in a hierarchy, kind of loosely. This is not intended to be precise in any way. And don't take the locations of the arrows, uh, arrows literally. These are not white matter tracks. Um, this is a boxology with a brain in the background. Um, so you have this kind of hierarchy, this kind of higher level semantic lexical stuff uh, out here. You have phonological stuff in this green loop, and then much lower sensory motor stuff uh, in sensory motor cortex. Okay, so that's, that's the hierarchy um, that I'm thinking about. Um, and just to hammer this home, I'm not going to try to get into the MPT model much at all, but this is, this is just a way that we have used to map the uh, the systems involved in speech production. But you could look at the old work by you know, uh, Lavelle and Indifri who have mapped 
networks for speech production, you see basically the same thing for the point that I'm trying to make. So basically, if you want to model word production, you can do it in simpler, complicated ways. We've done it in a conceptually simple way, but it looks complicated. Um, uh, and that's there. And this is mostly driven by uh, Grant Walker's work. And what we can do, so basically think of it as levels or uh, abilities in lexical processing and phonological ability. And so we kind of chopped up the process of producing a picture into these sub-abilities. We can estimate a patient's ability um, based on uh, the model and sort of Bayesian inference. And we can take those parameters and use that in, in a brain um, a lesion mapping uh, analysis. And this is kind of what you get. You get for higher level stuff, you get higher level areas. This is lexical, semantic stuff. This is uh, starting to get into phonological stuff. This is closer to lower level phonological stuff and you see auditory areas getting involved. And then more phonological stuff involves uh, other areas here that are a bit, bit closer to the sensory motor base, um, the lower level sensory motor stuff. The main point I want to illustrate here is that when we're even more talking about speech production, which is supposed to be a dorsal screen thing, when we look at it from the auditory system, it's involving semantic networks. It's involving lexical networks. So it's, it's important to think about that dual stream, to abstract away from the dual stream model and look at the whole picture when we're talking about other things. Okay. Enough of that. So uh, when we first started thinking about uh, sensory motor homologies uh, for speech, uh, nothing was known about the neural organization of that. Um, and so we wanted to identify sensory motor areas for speech. Um, and the way that we approached it was using evolutionary homology. We knew a lot about sensory motor properties for um, uh, uh, eye movements and for grasping involving the intraparietal sulcus. And in monkeys, it had certain properties like multiple parietal regions organized around motor effector systems. They show sensory and motor response properties and so on. And so we started looking for areas that showed similar properties or homologous properties in speech. So we had people listening to speech and producing speech, and we looked for areas that were active during both of those listening and producing conditions. And these red zones are the regions that we found in our initial studies. We focused on this region here, SPT, um, because it was homologously correct in the sense that it was close to its temporal parietal cortex. It was close to the zones that we already know are involved in visual motor integration, and so that was interesting to us. It looked like a human homolog of intraparietal sulfur areas and monkeys. Okay, so that's why we got excited about that. Uh, like I said, here's just an illustration of sensory and motor response properties. Not specific to speech, it works for humming, which we'll come back to later. Um, did I tell you guys where SPT comes from? The, the term? No? Okay. So just since we're on record, I might as well just get it out there. Um, I've told a few people, just so you know. So Brad Boxbaum was the graduate student, uh, and we were doing this study looking for what I told you we were looking for. And we were looking at subjects one at a time, um, and he would pull it up in you know, an old, I don't remember if it was the or some homegrown software. This was a while ago. And every time we pulled up an image, of course, those of you who've looked at single subject data that you haven't cleaned up, it's noisy as all get out. Um, but we kept, so I started making, you know, drawing pictures of the brain and circling where the activations were. Every time we looked at a new brain, it was activation right at the back of the sylvian fissure um, at the border of the temporal parietal junction. It was just like, dang, there's that spot again, there's that spot. So after we got through about 10, we're like, it's the spot, there's the spot. So we ended up calling it the spot, if that was our name for it. So when it came to writing a paper, we were going to just name the area. Um, we wanted to name it the spot, but you can't, right? So we had to come up with an acronym <laughs> that looked reasonable. Um, and that's where Sylvian parietal temporal came from, but actually it's just the spot. Um, so uh, the spot has mo motor effector selectivity, so another student, Judy Hogg, um, showed that even with the same auditory input, in this case it's melodies, if we change the motor effector output from vocal tract coming to manual uh, movements, that's imagining playing the piano, SPT activity was modulated. So it's not an auditory response, it's a sensory motor response. It's, it's relatively motor effective selected. It lines up pretty well with the lesions in conduction of patients. So um, we, we wondered for a while whether we had identified the functional focus of what's causing conduction of patients. This was 
an aggregate study involving Nina Drockers and Juliana Baldu who provided the conduction aphasia data. Here's an overlap map of conduction aphasia. Here's an aggregate analysis of over 100 scans of SPT. Um, and we see, here's SPT back here, and we see a pretty decent overlap with conduction aphasia. Not perfect. And this kind of extends up into the parietal lobe. You'll see a, a, something that looks sensory motor in the parietal lobe, which I've gotten interested in more recent, recently. We'll come back to that. Um, being a little more specific than conduction aphasia, we've looked at a behavior that should tax this ability, the sensory motor ability directly, that is the ability to repeat words verbatim. And this is a stroke study with Corianne Wigalski and others um, that shows that the lesion location, lesion, uh, location associated with deficits and repetition uh, overlaps with what we think is SPT. So all of that's kind of lined up. All of this work, and there's more that I'm not talking about, but all of this work has confirmed in my mind roughly that there's uh, uh, that these areas are homologous to some extent. That they have similar architecture, the response properties are similar. When you damage them, they produce similar deficits. So SPT, the claim is, is homologous to the parietal sulcus in the cats and um, From another standpoint, we know that this region has some uh, involvement in uh, feedback control. So feedback control is a concept that comes out of motor control research. It's a low-level thing. It's not part of linguistics. It's not that people don't develop phonological theories that, invo that invoke feedback control as a mechanism. Okay, so this is a new thing uh, to phonology. But when you do these experiments, so when you do these experiments, we find that um, you can uh, produce changes in activation in areas that uh, seem to map pretty well onto SPT. So this is a study by the Gunther's group, Jason Trullo, um, and it looks like SP the SPT region is activated. Um, or F1 shift in this case, so altered auditory feedback. You're detecting errors in your own speech. Uh, and of course, we've done work here with Ruzba uh, and Stroke doing similar things with altered auditory feedback, in this case, pitch, uh, where we show that people with aphasia have an attenuated response to altered auditory feedback. And the peak of that attenuation, uh, the lesions associated with the reduction that uh, map pretty closely onto the SPT zone, similar. Um, it's really hard to say for sure because you'd want to functionally localize SPT in each of these cases, but it's in the ballpark. Um, so, you know, consistent. so, can this general framework explain conduction aphasia? Well, I've developed a model, which I won't go into much detail, that is inspired by uh, motor control models that include a kind of internal model, for those of you who are familiar with that stuff, and it involves a deference copy uh, where a motor plan can be developed. Um, translated into an auditory representation to see if it's matching the target that you're trying to hit, um, and then making corrections if it is uh, off the target. Okay, so that's what this is doing, getting input from the lexical system. Um, so if you want to produce a word like cat, you activate an auditory target in your auditory system, you activate a motor plan, suppose you make a mistake, the motor system makes an error, it's coding a rat. You send an error, you send a prediction, this is what we're coding up. You notice that the system notices a mismatch in the auditory uh, zone, and it sends a correction signal to correct that error internally before you produce any, because so that's the basic idea. That, that's the fundamentals of how the model works. This, and that's, that's pretty fundamental motor control kind of stuff. Okay, this is, comes straight out of the motor control literature. Um, so if this is the architecture, suppose we have damage to this auditory motor translation zone, uh, which is SPT, um, and that's conduction aphasia. So you can, from this kind of setup, you can explain conduction aphasia very well. So perception is preserved because the input system is perfectly intact. Uh, production is fluent because you can still activate motor plans, uh, those aren't damaged, and you can still activate them directly via your lexical system. Um, but it's error prone, why? Because you can't check for errors before you produce, so you get an increased error rate. Um, you also have word length effects because the probability of an error goes up the more complicated the stimulus is phonologically. And remember, you can't check it, so it's just an increased error rate. Um, and repetition is very poor, especially for non words because you don't have the semantic group to go through. Okay. So it explains the symptoms or the, the symptom kind of state of conduction of Asia really nicely, satisfying all of those criteria. 
Um, we've expanded it into uh, incorporating sensory motor, uh, somatosensory loops, and I'm not going to go into that, but just know that it's more complicated. There's more to it than that. Okay, so conclusions from the, the phonology part of things. And then we'll tackle the difficult stuff syntax. And then I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to argue, after we do that, I'm going to argue that I was wrong about SPT, in part. And so that would be kind of a new thing. We'll see what that goes. Um, so there's pretty strong evidence, I think, for architectural and computational homologies between phonological levels of speech production and motor control generally. That is, when we talk about uh, phono producing phonological forms, um, it looks homologous to motor control circuits. It's not identical, more abstract, it's not reducible to motor control circuits, but it's, uh, they have common ancestors. Um, and that's, if, if, if we believe that they are homologous, then what that means is that they have a common neural computational ancestor. All right, so can we go beyond sound? So this is something that I've been interested in for a while. And if you look at the, the box and arrow models, the architectures that I've drawn, you see sensory motor architectures here, which is what you've seen before with SPT. You see a lower level one with this, with, uh, this kind of split motor and sensory structure. Uh, doing uh, lower level uh, articulatory processes. But you get to the word level, I'm like, no, that's one box. That's, that's not sensory motor, that's just a thing. So, but, because I didn't have much evidence for it. So I was, but I was thinking, well, if it applies to phonology uh, at its various levels, uh, phonology and phonetics, then why shouldn't it apply at the word level? Why can't we go higher with this basic architecture? And so that's something I've been thinking about for years and it kind of took, William's expertise in syntax to really build this out um, as an idea. So I'm going to, I'm gonna, you, you've heard William talk about this, and you can talk to him about the technical details of it. He'll do a much better job than I will. What I want to do is to conceptually motivate this idea for you and show how, in a sense, it's sensory motor. It's less clear that it's sensory motor because it's, it's syntax. We don't really understand syntax well, and there are lots of gaps in, in what we're doing. Um, but I think fundamentally it has a sensory motor organization. I'll show you. Okay, so there's some preliminaries, and that's where this receptive expressive asymmetry uh, stuff comes in. So at a given level, so phonological, syntactic, um, receptive and expressive abilities dissociate in interesting ways. So damage to dorsal stream networks can impair production without affecting uh, perception and, and comprehension, despite claims from mirror neuron and motor neuron kind of work. Address that a little bit. I'll show you some new data on that. Um, damage to ventral stream networks typically affect both production and expression. So the classic kind of clinical realization of this is broke is aphasia with severe motor output problems, and comprehension is basically intact, um, except for some problems with syntax that people address. Um, whereas Wernicke's aphasics, we think, you know, kind of undergraduate Wernicke's aphasia is, con is comprehension, but a prominent symptom is speech output problems, right? So that affects both. Uh, expression and uh, comprehension. Um, the expressive deficits with dorsal stream etiology, think Broca's aphasia, apraxia of speech, conduction aphasia, are distinguishable from those with ventral stream etiology. Think transportable sensory aphasia when you see it, think Wernicke's aphasia. Both Wernicke's and Broca's aphasics have, diff have speech production problems, but they're noticeably different. So the production problems that you see in dorsal versus ventral damage are different. That's these asymmetries, and this is just kind of to, to show you. We can look at a whole bunch of different syndromes. From a percular syndrome, you're familiar with the percular syndrome. This is severe, typically bilateral or percular lesions um, that produce uh, mutism and all sorts of problems. Um, uh, as far as we can tell, their receptive abilities are spared, and I'll show you the data on that. Um, apraxia of speech, I know some of you are studying this right now. Expressive speech sequencing errors and uh, dyspros dysprosodia. Uh, receptive abilities are generally spared. Broca's aphasia, same deal, generally spared, um, despite uh, non-fluency and paraphasic output, apraxia. Conduction aphasia are fluent and paraphasic, but generally spared in their receptive abilities. And on the ventral side, uh, Wernicke's aphasia, fluent, paraphasic, paradigmatic, with moderate impairment in the set by moderate, I mean, they can, they're not worked out. Um, and then word deafness is bilateral, uh, ventral stream damage, and the, the output uh, is fluent, uh, often paraphrasic, despite the, the idealized version of word deafness. 
and in folks' work um, Here's a case that we've recently been able to study. Uh, Grant Walker is doing most of the work. This is with the uh, collaboration with the University of uh, Texas at Houston. Vincent Tandren is the, um, the PI there that we work with. Um, this is a case of bilateral opercular resections, um, not done by our group, but done by someone else, but we were able to study a couple patients with this. Here's the cleanest case. So this person had no voluntary vocal tract control at all, um, couldn't stick out their tongue, couldn't do anything, so basically nothing, um, completely mute, um, couldn't smile to command, but had, had the typical Duchenne smile, I think it's called, elicited emotional. Um, spared, however, was minimal word, uh, minimal pair of word comprehension, so um, could pick a picture of a bear and discriminate it from pair with uh, auditory input, despite the minimal pair um, phonological discrimination. Word discrimination was perfectly paired, uh, spared, so if you say bear pair, same different, no problem. And simple reversible sentence comprehension uh, was uh, fine. Person did have some trouble with uh, complex sentences, kind of like broke as a basic pattern. Interestingly, because you have damage in these zones, we'll talk about that in a sec. So, why the funky asymmetry pattern? It falls out of the dual stream model uh, directly. So, um, uh, the, the funky asymmetry pattern generally. So, the dorsal stream is predominantly production related uh, when we think of it, or this, this level of the hierarchy, predominantly production related. The ventral stream is mostly its comprehension and production, so you get this funny asymmetry. All right. Um, all right, so that's one bit of preliminary. The second bit of preliminary I've already talked about, I think my last CSAR talk was on ventral stream, but this is the, the one slide summary of where we were. Um, so going from sound to semantics is essentially what the ventral stream is, uh, is doing. Um, from acoustic analysis in A1 and surrounds to phonological analysis, uh, it seems to be from the mid to posterior STS. Um, and then lexical level things or lemma level things if you're uh, talking in phonological and uh, psycholinguistic jargon, seems to be posterior MTG or maybe the dorsal bank uh, of the, the MTG. And semantics, this is coming straight out of finger and size work uh, with uh, a distinction between entity and event semantics in these two zones. So here's the conceptual argument for uh, deriving syntax out of this. So this is William before the view. Um, so here's the, here's the view from a receptive language. Event. So the goal of the ventral stream is to go from phonology to semantics, right? Okay, so, and, and you can think of phonology as a linear sequence of things that is provided by the speaker. The person talking to you hands you a linear sequence and puts it in your ear. So you don't have to, you don't have to compute a linear sequence that's given to you. But from that linear sequence, you have to get to a compositional representation. You have to be able to understand the meaning of the entire sentence um, where you're combining the words with their position in the structures. Okay? And to do that, uh, you need syntax from a, when we're using linguistic terminology, when we're using more general terminology, you have to take that linear sequence of phones, extract the words. The linear sequence of words isn't going to give you the right answer. You need to understand the hierarchy. What are the actual underlying relations between those words? You need to compute. That's not given to you. All you get is the linear stuff. You need to compute a hierarchical representation showing which words go together structurally. And from there, you can get to the composition of semantics. Okay? Very general characterization of what's going on. So we can kind of uh, expand this propositional stuff. And what I mean by that is you're combining entity concepts, the things that are in the sentence with the events, uh, the event structure that the verbs provide and so on. And that gives you what you need to know to, to comprehend. Um, so if we look at where these things seem to exist in the brain, uh, phonological stuff seems to be happening in, in and around the STG. So that's where presumably this linear sequence of items is. is uh, from the work of Binder and Desai, uh, we're assuming that you have this semantic kind of distinction between entities in anterior temporal lobe and event structure in posterior regions. Other people have contributed to this work as well, of course. Um, and what's right in between? There's this zone right in between. It seems like a good candidate. And this is just reasoning straight out of kind of mechanics. If you want to uh, 
an area that is going to be processing information from a few different sources and you don't want to put it, you want to put it nearby those sources. So it's a reasonable bet. And there's evidence that the brain actually develops this way. Uh, you want to put that zone kind of in the middle. Okay? So that a priori, without knowing anything else, that would be a good place for syntax to live. Okay? You see the kind of conceptual logic of that? Um, interestingly, so I told you that this region has also been implicated in um, lemma level stuff, word level, lexical level stuff, right? not phonological, but higher level things. Uh, and that's interesting because these days, syntactic theory is leaning towards a more lexical model, where it's not an abstract kind of skeleton of structure, it's actually lexical forms that have bits of syntax hanging on them. So, Tying it to lexical stuff is actually a useful, I mean, it's an interesting result that that's the case. Um, so, uh, so basically, so, so they, that's the view from, um, from the receptive side. Now from the expressive side, things are a little bit different. So you go from a, uh, you're starting up here with some conceptual structure. You have an idea of something you want to produce. From there, you need to get it into some hierarchy, presumably because that is the intermediate stage that allows you to linearize it. Now, unlike the case of perception, um, the linear sequence isn't given to you. So you're going to have to compute that. Okay? The brain is going to have to come up with a way to compute that. And the, in, the idea is that the region of the brain that's good at linearizing things, is computing sequences, is, everyone say it, the frontal lobe, right? Everyone thinks about sequence. Uh, generation or sequencing as a frontal mode thing. Okay. Not specific to language, you can see it in other domains as well. So that's the basic idea. Hierarchical stuff is back here with lexical things, and, and it's hierarchical because these lexical forms kind of have hierarchical forms attached. Okay. Um, the linear sequencing part is frontal mode, and our best guess a priori is that it's going to be some portion of Broca's area because Broca's area is implicated in various syntactic things. And so that's a reasonable guess. Um, so if this is true, we could explain the basic kind of course neurology of syntax. Okay? So you get a grammatism versus paragrammatism uh, based on damage to these two different uh, zones. So a grammatism is a failure of the ability to linearize from a hierarchical representation. Okay? You're not able to do that. Minimal sentence comprehension deficit. People with agramatism are pretty decent at comprehending sentences, but they do have trouble if it gets too complicated. And the idea there um, is that uh, if you're asked to, complicate a, uh, to comprehend a fairly complicated sentence, oftentimes working memory is useful. You want to say it back to yourself, and that's something that you're going to need to, to linearize it for yourself, to repeat it back, to, to process it in some sort of working memory. And that's why you get some of these deficits. Because if you happen to miss it the first time through, there's no way if you don't have that linearization process to, to replay it for yourself. Um, posterior dynamics leads to paragrammatism, which is, on this model, a deficit in the ability to represent the hierarchy of the sentence. So you're just, it's almost like you're just getting the linear sequence, which you can comprehend bits and pieces, but you're not getting all the grammatical structure. Um, so you get a more severe sentence comprehension deficit, and it affects both receptive and expressive syntax uh, because receptively you can't get to the intermediate representation that can get you to the compositional semantics, and expressively because you can't get from the compositional semantics stuff effectively through the, uh, the hierarchical representations, which presumably help you code the, the appropriate linear sequence. So as a test, so this is a paper that William and I uh, recently published. I'm not sure if it's out yet. Um, here's a, another paper that we've been working on to test the prediction. Um, uh, um, it's a lesion study looking at the, the lesion correlates of paragrammatism versus agrammatism. And this is hard, as you know, if you looked at agrammatism versus paragrammatism, this is non-trivial to quantify. Um, so we had people basically uh, rate you know, the degree to which individual patients were agrammatic versus paragrammatic and looked at the lesion correlates of them. And uh, consistent with the prediction, we get a really nice clean dissociation that agrammatic symptomatology is associated with posterior inferior frontal uh, and um, paragrammatism is associated with um, roughly the zone that produces vertical. 
Um, so that's pretty decent confirmation. So here's the kind of generalized sensory motor architecture for language. So I mean, again, the idea is that it's following a similar, uh, a similar plan. Um, so you have uh, these levels, these sensory motor levels, and again, by sensory motor, I mean abstractly. So they're sensory motor from, a, from the brain perspective in the sense that the sensory part is in the back of the brain, the motor part is in the front or frontocolloidal regions, um, and these things need to interact. So these, are, these are interactive components. Um, for comprehension, you only need the posterior stuff. So this is the comprehension network. You only need to get through these levels to the comprehension network, and that's, that's all you really need under most circumstances. There are a few fringe cases, but if we're talking about the amount of variance you, you can account for uh, by involving the motor system, it's pretty darn small. And we could talk more about that. On the production side, you need the whole network. You need to be able to get uh, through all of these things um, in order to produce uh, speech effectively. Okay, so these, this is the hierarchy that you need to access. But because these sensory and motor things are coding different things, they're coding sensory targets or hierarchical targets, if you want to think of it that way, versus the actual sequence, uh, in these cases, you get different syndromes depending on whether you're in, in production, depending on whether you damage the frontal or posterior areas. All right, so that's all on the syntax. Hopefully that's kind of conceptually motivated the idea and how it's, it follows a basic sensory motor plan. Um, all right, so what's SPT doing? This will be in the last section. Um, so for the last 10 years, I've assumed that it's doing, uh, or more, yeah, um, uh, an auditory motor interface for vocal tract action. So that, that claim came out of the observation that it wasn't just speech, it wasn't just phonology that activated SPT. You could have people listen to Jabberwocky sentences and reproduce them and we would get good activation. But then we could play them simple, you know, two, three bar measure uh, melodies and they and ask them to hum them back and that activated SPT just as well. Um, that's actually a problem if you think about it. So I assume that, okay, it's not just speech, it's not just phonology, it's any vocal tract action from saying Jabberwocky to humming a simple melody. But there's a problem there, and the problem is that there's a complexity difference, presumably, because speech involves melodic stuff, so you're doing that already in speech, but then you're adding all this complicated phonological stuff. That should drive SPT a lot more, right? So we'd expect a lot more activity through speech than for reproducing simple melodies, and yet, we don't see that difference. In fact, we see almost more activity in it for the melodic stuff than for um, speech. So that's something we've ignored for years. I didn't even think it was a problem until we noticed it. Um, but looking back, it's a potential problem. This was the study, unpublished, unfortunately, so far, um, that made me rethink SPT. We wanted to look at motor effector selectivity in a more tightly controlled way than using musicians and pianos, uh, uh, playing piano. So what we did, is, one of my students was at Eisenberg, um, did an experiment where we had people uh, taking a sensory input, an acoustic input, in this case a moving sound source, so noise would move back and forth, and you had to follow it with your finger or your tongue, a little weird, or your eyes, okay, and we expected vocal tract, tongue, SPT, it's going to activate, um, eyes not so much, finger not so much, and we saw nothing in SPT for the tongue. A little bit of something for the other motor vectors. So that was really weird, and I thought, there's no way that that's real, because we have people reproducing a simple melody, and SPT goes crazy. That's like more natural, it's not a contrived, it's really sensory driven task, it's you know, something we've learned, it's what's going on. So we did this other, even weirder study, where we compared tongue tracking, same spatially moving signal, with laryngeal tracking. And so let me tell you how you track a sound with your larynx. Um, imagine that there's a pitch scale from low to high, and as the sound moves around, you follow it with your voice. So, like that. So that's what people did. We trained them to do it. They did it sub-vocally. And this is what we found. Tongue tracking activated, not surprisingly, sensory motor cortex. Um, laryngeal tracking made SPT go crazy. So that made me think, okay, maybe we were wrong about the supralaryngeal vocal tract in SPT. It's not doing that at all. It's just doing laryngeal motor control. Okay, so that's, that's the idea. Um, but then I have the problem of explaining conduction occasion. 
Not even paraphasic errors from laryngeal, and shouldn't they just have prosodic problems, right? Well, so I started thinking about that, and this is a conjecture, which is a better word than speculation. Um, so there, we know that, that phonological stuff, lexical stuff, is inserted into some frame structure, right? You don't just plan phoneme by phoneme, you have a frame of some sort to put it in. The usual idea is that that's a syntactic thing. But there are ideas that there are prosodic frames. Okay? Um, here's one from Stephanie Shea, I think. Uh, and it's reason there's evidence for it. There's reasonable evidence that prosodic frames play a role. Uh, maybe a more intuitive way for you guys to think about it is think about the rhythm of speech. Um, if you mess up the rhythm of speech, uh, it can cause a lot of problems in slotting in the phonemes on time if you mess up the time. So suppose this laryngeal control circuit is important for uh, rhythmic timing of speech. Um, that could be the basis of generating an increased number of phonological errors because you just don't have the slots. You've lost your frame, now you're trying to sequence things in and it just is not far enough. Place. That's, that's a possibility. That we, these are testable ideas. What's interesting is that there's a lot of evolutionary significance to this, so in terms of the evolution of language. So voluntary laryngeal control is present in humans but not non-human apes. You can't ask a, a gorilla to hum a melody or train them to hum a melody. You can train them to vocalize or not, but you can't tell them to voluntarily control the language. They don't have the direct connections to um, the relevant brainstem nuclei, um, which humans do. That's actually a controversial issue, but I'm going to skip it for now. Um, so, and so because of this, some people have uh, claim that voluntary laryngeal control is a key innovation in language evolution. This is the Piper's Jurgens hypothesis. It's been around for a while. But you're going to have some cortical control from, say, the laryngeal motor cortex down into the brainstem to control the larynx. We know from sensory motor control generally that just having you know, a motor cortex controlling this isn't enough. You need sensory motor control. And maybe SPT is actually the cortical network that controls that. So that's a potential this SPT network. Um, but then that leads open the question of uh, where's the super laryngeal control circuit? And I'm going to, since I'm running low on time, and since I don't have much data to support it, I'm going to point to this red block out here um, that shows up in our SPT studies, that shows up in other tasks as well as a possible candidate for a higher level sensory motor circuit related to phonology uh, that may be coding uh, information uh, kind of at the word level, uh, the phonological word level. So that's the speculation and then the basis of a grant. I think that's a good question for a grant, so that's one more. Um, I'm going to skip the rest of this and say thank you to all my collaborators and everyone here. Thank you. I quickly do is take questions from the room, and if you don't mind repeating the question, please. Yes. Then we'll take questions from uh, online. Julius. So you talked about the effect of damage on the ventral and dorsal stream. Um, so damage to the dorsal stream doesn't cause any problems with comprehension. But what about during development? What does damage to the dorsal stream do to the development of, for example, just language comprehension in children? Do we know anything about that? Uh, the question was, what does damage to the dorsal stream in development cause with respect to perception and comprehension? I don't know the data. I don't know the literature. Does anybody know? I would expect no problems at all. Well, OK, I know something. Um, we know that, uh, that cerebral palsy, um, severe cerebral palsy that can produce anarthria, does not impair receptive abilities. So we know that. We know that for sure. That was work by Dorothy Bishop in 1990, a beautiful study. Uh, so have a look at that. That's, that's pretty great. I think there's a paper from the Friedrichi group that ties uh, connect, connections to inferior frontal gyrus with developmental progress in kids, so in children. And the idea is that they only start doing certain things after that connection is... Yeah, so some frontotemporal connection is required for normal development. Certainly that would be the case for production. And that's presumably what kids are learning to do when they babble and start talking, is figuring out these sensory motor mappings in their internal model. Um, but apparently, you don't need that for comprehension and perception. William. 
respect to the uh, homology idea, very familiar with the work of Bill and Sardi and others, linguists basically looking at the, in a nutshell, the computational complexity of human language phonology versus syntax and showing that there seems to be really a fundamental distinction in terms of a Chomsky hierarchy. And then they, they can say, they can show that in birdsong or other animal systems that it looks like human phonology but not the same as human syntax. So I guess my question is, what is the, have you thought about that with respect to your homology view? Yeah, so Lane is questioning whether the homology actually scales up to syntax because syntax is rather different. And um, yes, uh, I'll admit that it feels like a bit of a stretch to call it sensory motor in some ways. I and mean, we've talked about the fact that it doesn't look like there's an SPT for syntax, uh, although maybe that parietal lobe thing is something is, is doing something. These are all questions to look at. Um, and I would agree. I don't think there's any, so I think you can live with both ideas that syntax is very different than phonology slash birdsong, but it still be laid out on a fundamentally sensory motor plan. Um, uh, and may have evolved from that kind of plan. Um, but it could just have evolved to be so different that it's not as recognized. I mean, a bat wing and a hand look pretty different. So yeah, hand wavy kind of yes, that's interesting question. Um, in any case, I mean, what I what I would say is that the idea of thinking about syntax as a sensory motor system has has inspired the distinctions that we've made. So we can think about the posterior part that is important for production and comprehension. We can think about an anterior part that's mostly involved in production, and things worked. It works better than what we had before, in my view. Um, so, to that extent, thinking from an evolutionary standpoint is useful. Yes. Uh, related to that, so I mean, you know, you can think of motor control in the visual domain and the auditory domain or the phonological domain, right? So there's certain principles that are shared, but the information that you're processing is very different in terms of auditory information. You're trying to hit spectral temporal targets. In visual domain, trying to hit a particular location in space, and so could you think about syntax in that respect? Is that there's some architecture that's shared and borrowed, but that the nature of the information that you're computing or processing with is maybe completely unique or different? Yeah. So the question is, uh, the the idea that is that the architecture may be similar in syntax, but the nature of the information is radically different. Yes, I think that's absolutely possible. Um, and so, you know, we can maybe think about the basic sensory motor architecture of syntax as the system for production is set up so that you're aiming to hit hierarchical targets with linear sequences, whatever that means. Right? And, uh, well, we kind of know what it means. It means that if you get this linear sequence right, you'll, the listener will be able to reconstruct the hierarchical target. Um, so we can think of it in sensory motor terms there, but. Yeah, it's kind of, as we know from theoretical syntax, it's going to be a complicated system. Or just merge, either one. Yes? Um, I was wondering if you had some way of producing the same sound, um, like in your study, like filming during your own production, if it was the same uh, repetitively, like they were desensitized to it, versus it was uh, constantly changing, if you would predict that you would see a difference in um, the SPT based on is it production or is it regulation? Um, it, it seems to be load dependent, at least for what we, you know, and we can take conduction aphasia as, as an example. Um, uh, so more complicated things are, are more likely to produce errors. And my explanation for that is that you can activate the motor plans for producing um, speech <coughs> or a, a original output, like coming melody. Um, it's when you make a mistake in the motor planning that you need to really reference the target. So and one way to think of it is, is go back to say regular old motor control. So imagine you're sitting at your desk and you have your coffee cup in the usual location and you're just sitting there and you don't really need sensory input to know that it's there, it's in your memory. You just activate a plan and it automatically goes and grabs it and you take a drink and put it back. Now if it's moved and you're reaching and it's gone, well now you need the target. You, there's some error or something's happening. You need to get that sensory information. If it's moving, if, you have, you know, if you're fatigued, anything that's going to change that learned motor program that you can just activate as a chunk, then you're going to need that sensory motor loop. 
um, to guide that action. So it's the load dependent part that matters. So if you're just you know, doing a simple laryngeal action that is kind of on autopilot, um, you wouldn't need that sensory motor loop as much. Uh, sure, online question. Yeah. Online question from Lorraine Obler. How is the putative spot speaking related to the so-called Geschwind area in terms of its localization? I guess the follow-up would be, and what does that mean? Yeah, I think the classical Geschwind area, which I haven't studied in detail, is different. Um, and it's more kind of uh, SMG angular gyrus zone. People correct me if I'm OK. Um, so it's different. SPT is, is pretty much squarely in the sylvian fissure. Uh, prior operculum plan temporality zone. Geschwind's area is outside. So um, I would say that this parietal zone that I'm pointing to as possibly involved in a higher level phonological sensory motor circuit could map onto Geschwind's territory. I bring this image up from Katani um, as partial support for that because Katani has been talking about white matter pathways that go from roughly STG uh, supergeneral sulcus into that gastrointestinal territory, and then from there up to pretty posterior uh, zones in the frontal lobe. Um, and so that could be the relevant circuit for this higher level uh, uh, stream that I'm speculating about. Um, so a little bit different learning, but um, maybe related to the second idea I had. Uh, question over here. I was curious, what are the, um, the similarities between uh, speech processing neural networks and uh, the comprehension networks in the brain for language? Relation between speech processing networks uh, and the, the architecture perception. of those networks, right? In perception right. for yeah. in relation to the comprehension network. Yeah, so that would, um, the assumption that I didn't talk about was that the speech perception, lower level speech perception networks are bilateral in the STG. And, uh, and largely bilateral up to the phonological level in the SPS. And then the deeper you get into the system, into lexical stuff and syntactic stuff, the more left dominant it is. Does that answer your question? Yeah, and second question going off that. Um, so what are the similarities also between like um, neural networks like coded in uh, coding languages such as like Python, MATLAB, those sort of things? For language processing and um, networks for language processing in our brains. What's the relationship between like artificial right for artificial uh, language models? So or, yeah. and what's happening in our brain? Um, I, I don't know. Um, I mean, certainly you can. Build, are you thinking of networks that can do speech recognition and things like that? Right, those types of networks. Yeah, um, they're different. I'll tell you that, but they may provide well. Maybe not. I mean, one interesting thing from the speech recognition literature, so one thing that I didn't talk about is I, I don't think on the perceptual side that we're, rec we're coding and representing individual phonemes. A lot of people assume that speech perception involves doing some acoustic analysis, and then you extract phoneme information that's sequenced, and from there you get syllables, or you, know, you just kind of go up the hierarchy. Um, I think phonemes are a property of the, the dorsal stream phonological circuit. So when we're recognizing speech, we're just kind of taking in something that's close to a syllable size. Um, and what's interesting about the speech recognition world is that they used to try to extract phonemes, but they don't do that anymore. They do try phones or whatever you call it. Um, so they're actually kind of doing something similar. Um, so maybe there's some parallels there. Um, but the thing about automated speech recognition is they have, they're solving a different problem than, than we are. Um, they need to identify which of the vocabulary words in their lexicon they're hearing. Uh, and they use context, they use, they're constrained by the number of words that are in the dictionary, um, whereas we are not. To try and ask them Siri to tell you what one is, and it'll give you all sorts of different things besides what, which you guys all get what. Kids do too. So different, but maybe there's something we can learn. Online, online, yes. Okay. This is a question from Sean Stelly at South Alabama. This spot lights up because of laryngeal control. So do you think that the laryngeal articulator theory of phonology, I believe John Essling, would be more applicable to the overall model? 
I'm agnostic on, on what phonological theory is the correct one. I, it's not my area, uh, um, so I leave it. I think that's best addressed using traditional phonological methods at this stage, or you know, linguistic methods. So I, I don't have, I don't come down on one side or the other on these sorts of questions. I mean, some of the brain data can be relevant, like the fact that we see overlap in what appears to be a syntactic area and lexical area. Is this consistent with the one but not other types of linguistic theory? So potentially there is some feedback from brain uh, data to linguistic theory, which would be great. Um, but I don't have much to say about phonological theories. We have another one from Mick McNeil. I wonder if this will change your basic model or hypothesis in any way that is substantive, but apraxia speech is not a disorder of sound sequencing. People with apraxia speech without concomitant aphasia do not produce phonemic errors of sequence, anticipatory, perceptive, or metathetic, more often than in healthy controls. If this is accurate, does it change your inclusion of them as an example of homology? I think of I think of apraxia of speech as also being a, a sensory motor deficit or affecting a sensory motor circuit, probably more towards the motor side. If, uh, if although there's evidence that somatosensory cortex is involved, um, but I think of it as a lower hierarchical level. So it's not at the phonological level. It's at a level where we're implicating probably S1, M1, premotor cortex, uh, wherever you know, something a bit lower level. So. I don't think, whatever, and, and, and it's an empirical question. If, if we get a really good description of apraxia of speech that says that it's applying it to these kinds of things um, and it's implicating these brain areas, then it will just kind of uh, change the details of what I'm suggesting. I don't think it changes anything fundamentally about the way things work, in my mind. He speaks in two weeks, so you can heckle him that. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Um, way at the beginning, you showed a slide. Uh, uh, you were talking about uh, basic cognitive abilities that uh, non-prime, uh, that non-human primates would have. So I was just wondering, what would be a good example of hierarchical processing, mm -hmm. non-linguistic language hierarchical processing? Yeah, that's one that um, that's one that's a bit more controversial. I mean, people, some people claim that hierarchical processing is something more linguistic. Um, I don't think that most people, maybe William can answer this better than I can. Um, there, there are examples of motor control things that are hierarchical that I think are pretty good examples and I'd have to go dig up the references but there was some work that I was reading about in the motor control world that uh, really argued for hierarchical representations. Um, I mean you can think really broadly. The sensory motor system in general is massively hierarchical. Right? So you have reflex spinal cord reflexes, and then you have low level things and higher level things, so certainly there's a hierarchy of sensory motor processes where you have control of individual uh, muscles versus limbs versus sequences of things, and I think that is a reasonable hierarchy. Um, uh, I will send a reference to a, a paper that argues that you need hierarchical coding in order to do motor control generally, but I don't have enough. You can on uh, conduction aphasia on the in the model. If you so, and, and this goes for any theory that that, uh, that claims in one way or another that the, that the errors that reach the output reach it because of a failure of monitoring or error checking. Right? I'm not sure if error checking is the correct paraphrase for what you're suggesting. So, so in all such models, um, it still seems that that's a lot of errors if it's just. The checking mechanism that is going on. That means that we, when we speak, are continuously, you know, uh, filtering out and, and correcting and, and monitoring hundreds of errors in every you know, piece of text that we utter. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, so is the, that really what you think, or is yeah. that, or, or 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 is it possible, or maybe necessary in the theory that there is some separate error generating mechanism, yeah. something that creates the errors? In the right. Text. So uh, the question is, uh, given that the number of errors that we see in conduction aphasia, that would imply that as healthy people we're generating a massive number of errors that we are then correcting. And I actually think that's the case. Um, 
Yeah, so, you know, I mean, I, I think in a lot of cases, if you met, if you looked at hesitations in speech and think those are examples of where we're coding something up, we're doing this error correction, we're checking mechanism, and we're doing those corrections. I really do think, so certainly I believe that every day, all the time, we are invoking this internal error correction mechanism to prevent errors. Um, absolutely. One, one note, too, I should say that um, uh, the kind of song and dance I did with the prosodic frame kind of goes away if we assume that there are two different circuits. So conduction aphasia, conduction aphasia, the lesions kind of extend over both of these zones and it might involve multiple layers of phonological circuits. So um, you know, I'll just mention, I forgot to mention that. On the error checking issue, wasn't there an argument from the speed at which people can correct errors such that it implies that they have a certain internal model the yeah, fact is that there you respond to errors in some sense extremely quickly implies that yes. they're not passive. Right? Yeah, the point the, the point, not so much a question was was what isn't there evidence from the speed at which errors can be corrected that suggests internal error correction? Absolutely, there's behavioral evidence for that. Uh, example classical examples are people will say, uh, it's the ver I mean horizontal. There's not enough time to overtly hear that incorrect articulation. It had to have been caught before articulation. Uh, was initiated, but it couldn't stop the initial part. Uh, there's also evidence from taboo slips at the time, um, where you induce people to make speech errors where they say something nasty, uh, and people uh, will reduce their error rates, their slip rates in those cases, which can only be explained by some increased salience of those things that triggers the correction. Okay, thank you. We are premature. I, I see another. Um, do we want to do one more online? Okay. I'm happy to do it. Fran, I know you are agnostic about phonological theory, but you keep referring to phonology as linear. Linear seems to be important to determine where it is processed. Uh, what if it is not linear? Do you mean linear or sequential? Uh, I, either one of those works for me. I don't think it, it matters so much. The point is that information is coming in over time. And that time-based information is what the auditory system gets as its input. So however we deal with that, or what we call it, doesn't much matter to me. Now we can thank now you. Now we can thank you. <laughs>